Hey guys, how you guys doing? Uh, today we're going to be joined by AJ Blazek, who's the offensive line coach at North Dakota State University. Uh, today's talk is primarily, primarily going to be over power, um, some of the things they do with power, um, some of the drills that go along with and some of their adjustments they get when they get looks that they either do or do not like um, against power. So um, this week's going to be a big talk on offensive line play and I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, make sure you guys subscribe to the weekly content I put out especially with a lot of these coaches being a little more free than they usually are. I'm going to try to get a lot of these guys on. So um, make sure you guys subscribe and uh, enjoy. All right, Coach, um, you've been – you've talked about how you were primarily in a, in a zone scheme and now you've, you've kind of gone a gap and a little bit of power. What's been the biggest change? And then has your thoughts changed at all on gap to zone? Or what, what, do, you, what do you believe in now? Well, I, you know, beliefs, I think, are evolved over time. You know, and, and obviously going from job to, you know, different places, different coordinators. You know, at Rutgers, we had three coordinators in three years. So you, you're trying to learn different stuff, yet make things fit that, that philosophically you believe in. And, you know, ever since my days with, with Coach Ferentz at Iowa, you know, was all that's where I learned the zone game inside, outside, and, you know, the slant play. And, and, and that's, that, that, that's been my bread and butter for 15, 16 years. Um, you know, in high school, junior college, it was power ISO toss and right. when you learn the zone. And so, you know, you go back and forth as a coach right. um, of things that you believe in and you have success. And I think ultimately you got to look at what your players can do, you know, and go, okay, as the coach, it's my job to adjust to them. And then, you know, I've really had this revelation here at North Dakota State where our inside outside power game game plans and complements itself um, just like inside outside zone. And so when I, when I talk about my beliefs, my beliefs are to have great base plays with great compliments and not teach your guys a whole bunch of new stuff. And, you know, once they know your base plays and where the ball is going, what the hot spots in the blocking scheme are, you know, what, and then they know how they can adjust those hot spots. And where I'm talking kind of the crucial issues with certain schemes. Right. If they can understand that and you can teach them that and they can manipulate those a little bit, now an inside-outside path by a back, read by a quarterback, all that stuff supplemental. But for the line of scrimmage, you know, there's a lot of carryover. And now you start going gap, gap scheme, man scheme, zone scheme, that stuff starts to get taxing on a guy. You, you know, you're limited in reps, you're limited in – but if you're talking about inside footwork and, and with the gap scheme, inside gaps and rule gap rules, you know, inside, outside, that's on us as coaches. But the, the carryover for the kids is the same. And so I've become a huge, huge believer. I love our A-gap power here. It is um, probably the core of what we do. You know, I know Tyler Rolls played in it, coached in it. Now he's calling it. Uh, probably come back to calling a little more of it than he had in the past. And, and it really, it's what our guys hang their hat on. And you got an A gap, you got an or an inside, you got an outside power, and then you got a no pull power. And so you got all kinds of for certain situations and certain personnel matchups and certain fronts. And you know, there's a lot of whys and a lot of reasons to what you like better. But ultimately it comes down to who our personnel is at each spot. And, you know, whether I was at Rutgers working, you know, we were developing the no pull power and, and some stuff that that uh, you know Jerry started, Jerry Kill and John McNulty kind of came in and evolved with some of that where we had some success. Um, you know, I think that that's the stuff I've been able to grow and make a lot of mistakes. And the older you get, I think you become a better coach just because you've made more mistakes. Right. You know? And so I, I go back and forth, but I, I really believe in our inside gap scheme. Um, and I love the slant play. You know, those are probably, if I was to say, who are we, you know, we're an A gap power team that's going to run outside zone to keep them honest. And we have ways to complement that both ways, play action, and you know some misdirection. Yeah, it's, that's that's good stuff. And if you don't mind, um, I, I'm a huge fan of how you guys run power, and especially a gap power. Um, do you want to talk about a gap power a little bit? Maybe what you guys are looking for game plan wise on why you want to run it, and what like what's the big drive force behind that play? Well, I, I think it's a you know when you start talking about your base play, your fundamental play for your program, like our program hangs their hat on it. There's posters in there. Keep calm, run power. Yeah. And, you know, which kind of power, I love you know, whatever that might be. And like I said, you know, there's the sayings out there, power is God's play. And, well, you know, sometimes guys get stuck in, hey, this is my scheme and we're going to run it. Right. And I think that's a fault of coaches. So, you know, for us, I came in and really spent the first year 
Zach Johnson was a senior, fifth year senior. And then I had five juniors, uh, six juniors that'll all be seniors this coming year. And so when you got older guys that have been running something so long, those hot spots or those little nuances, I, I ask them a lot of questions because as coaches, we can always go, hey, these guys have that guy, and sure, here we go, bada boom, bada bang. Right. But those players did an awesome job helping me kind of learn it last spring. And over the summer, I, that's where I got the visual of, okay, we're going to game plan this just like I've always game plan inside, outside zone. Right. And so, you know, to answer your question, you know, it comes back a lot of times to run support. You know, what are you going to do? To, to, are you going to play low quarters? Are you going to – um, are you going to play hard corners, you know, try and support with the corners, keep the safeties high because of our tight end pass game? Or are you going to try and roll a safety, you know, whether it's strong week or we face some good teams, I'll try and drop them in the box and buzz them in. So our number one thing is to find out where our coverage is coming from, where the run supports at. Okay. And then whether it's inside zone or inside power or outside power and outside zone, a lot of times they play off each other the very same way. You know, and, and from year to year, we have certain guys that pull better or run better or, you know, our pin pull scheme. I, I learned I learned some stuff from the number of the NFL guys that I've had a chance to spend time with. Don't just pull the guard just because it's a three technique. Pull the best puller and, you know, let, let, the, let, let the blocks. So, so we do different stuff scheme-wise there. And we, we have different ways that we can handle stuff if, if we're seeing a great D lineman at a certain spot. And so ours is a lot of personnel based how we're going to attack people. Okay. That's good. I, I know I got a lot of questions for a lot of guys um, that one, one of that answers. I mean, everyone loves a gap power. So thank you. Um, another question is um, what are you guys doing universally that you think everybody else should be doing um, that you guys kind of hang your hat on? Well, I, I think, and like I said, I, I, one of the things I think is out there right now, a lot of people are in the unbalanced world. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think formation to the boundary, that stuff gives people fits, you know, because a lot of times in the no huddle day, you know, we're, if I said anything right now that we're doing, I think more people should do huddle. Yeah. You know, get in the huddle. Uh, I think it gives your guys extra time. You know, yeah. I break the huddle, you're alignment. Okay. I hear it. Okay. We're going to zone scheme. I turn around, ready, break. I can ID my front. I got time. You know, we'll run 68 plays a game. And, you know, I, I get, I understand that if I have the ball 100 snaps, we score this many points. Well, we have it probably 30 less than a lot of those high-tempo teams and score as many points. Right. Sure, it still comes back to the personnel you have. Because in year one at Rutgers, we tried to run 100 snaps. Year two, we tried to run 58. Hmm. And, you know, so they both – It if you don't have the same personnel, slows the game down. You know, if you're trying to build a program, it keeps the score a little closer. Right. As opposed to just, hey, we're going to go fast so we can go fast. I've seen everybody else doing it. Well, everybody else has those answers. A lot of the gurus of whatever you run, Coach Roll, our ROC, he's been here for so long. His trade ship, they're a headache, you know, but he knows which ones have issues. He knows what has given us issues, and we want to avoid those. Right. And so for me – I, I, I think the uh, the biggest one, I love, I love huddle. Um, I, hold on, Coach. I think you're huddle breaking up a little bit there, Coach. Hold on. The game down. You're, you're breaking up just a little bit. I'm going to pause you for a second. See, there we okay. go. Yep, we're good now. Are we good to go? Sometimes I break up down here. Yeah, you're good. Side. I got you now. We're all good. Okay, you can keep going. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, and, then, and so I, like I just – I was answered. I said my biggest thing is I think guys should contemplate huddling more, especially if you're not the better team week in, week out, because it keeps scores closer. Well, if you're within 14 or 7 in the fourth quarter, your kids believe in it. Right. If you're trying to go super fast and you're down 47 at halftime, kids quit on you. And so I think there's a time and a place, and obviously every program has a different point in its evolution. You know, in our guys – Hey, catch your breath. Let's line up and go hammer somebody again because right. we're going to hang our hat on. We're going to physically try and abuse you. I know as a, as a OC before, I, I think huddling wise, and I like to slow the tempo and, and do the uh, look to the sideline. I think it gives your kids a good mental picture of what they're going to see pre-snap and what their assignment is and gives them a little bit more time to clarify uh, what their job is. So I, I definitely agree. I, I think 
I think it's slowing the tempo gives you a fighting chance, especially if you're building a program. So I definitely agree with all those points. That's for sure. Well, and on the flip side, if you got really good skill athletes and a lot of them, and you got a quarterback who operates and he can think that fast and process, hey, there's a place to take advantage of what you have. So I think they both work, but that's the one I think more guys should contemplate doing what's best for their program, not just right. what they see. Definitely. Um, next question I have is um, like what's, what's your personal philosophy in, uh, offensively and maybe um, with the guys up front and who kind of influenced um, your thinking? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I, I think, once again, the older you get, you've been around enough different people, good, bad, successful teams, whatever. Right. Um, you know, I think I got to go back to uh, junior college and Troy Morrill talked about just the physical will and pounding on guys. And, you know, we, we were a pretty good ball club and, and we hung our hat on that. But then, you know, what everything I took from Coach Ferentz, you know, we're going to do a couple things and we're going to be really good at them. And we're going to get so good at them that the players know the answers, the players know defensive adjustments. And so when you're out there playing, and everybody hears it and talks about it, he's been doing it for 20-plus years now, that when Iowa's on the football field, they're going to be so fundamentally sound that they could be mismatched or, or outmatched at eight of the 11 positions, and they still got a chance to beat you because every one of those guys knows what's going on. And I think there's something to be said for, whether it's the Z receiver or the left guard. They all can tell you what's the aiming point, where are we trying to put the ball, how are we going to stop run support, and who's working together to get this done. And if they all can do that, you know, I think that that goes back to you can only do so much. Right. And, and so I think that Kirk, Kirk was a lot there. And you just go down the tree. I, I, I evolved a little bit in the no huddle stuff for, for the next probably four years out in Fort Hayes. Tom Sawyer influenced me much more on the psyche of the players. Like, I showed up at Division II Winona State and was going, what, what, our guys aren't here all summer. What's wrong? What are we doing? And his philosophy of, hey, I want them fresh when they come back in August. And when he, he's been at Winona State his whole career, played there, coached there. Right. I was, it made me step back and go, you know what? There is a place for sanity. Mental health is a big thing right now. Right. And I, I think there is a break that guys need. And just like right now, I hope the NCAA thinks our guys need to get back together too for a psyche. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's training or not, let's find a way to health in a healthy way, get these guys back in their routine a little bit, because I'll be honest, some of them are struggling being isolated on their own. Oh, definitely. I, I, so I Tom was a big psyche guy. Um, and then, you know, along my way, we go from there to Bob Nielsen at Western Illinois it was a lot like Kirk, you know, we're going to be really good at what we do. And Teddy Schlocky, the OC that I was with there, um, who's now at South Dakota, super creative, ultra sharp, young mind, uh, played quarterback, thinks about it like a, but he, him and I had a lot of fun um, evolving uh, kind of a, a run play action, 11 personnel, no huddle verbiage, created it from scratch. So probably packaging stuff. I learned a lot with Teddy um, and we, we, you know, we play him every year. He does a great job with stuff. And then I go out to Rutgers. You know, you learned a lot of things. Chris, I, I learned a lot of defense, which how to help attack a defense, how to prove things. And, you know, he, he always wanted to be really hard on why this, why this, why this, what's the answer. And, and it made me such a better coach that as a head coach, you know, ask your guys why. Make them prove stuff. It's not just, well, I, I trust him. He's good. You know, if you can prove it and you got to fight for it, you can believe in it because, you know, you, you, know, you have ownership in it. And, uh, and then really at the end, you know, Jerry Kill was a big guy and then clock management. And that's why I talked about control the clock. And right. he was a master of rebuilding programs. Well, he's also a master of helping us trying to, we won four games that year was the best in our first three years we did. And, and it was because we just kept ourselves in games a little longer. Right. You know, and, and, and we're sound. So I, I can't pinpoint one guy, but they've all had a piece in my evolution. Awesome. Um, Next question I'm going to ask you is more install process. So when you guys go through training camp, what does your install process look like? Maybe you can talk about North Dakota a little bit or maybe your own, what you think is yeah. best for your kids. No, definitely. Like I said, tell, tell me if I get broken up here a little bit and I'll, I'll pump the brakes. But, um, you know, the first two days, obviously not being in, in pads, that always tweaks it. You know, I said earlier, we're going to hang our hat on A-gap power. But our first two days, we're going to get all of our inside and outside zone stuff in. Um, you know, I'd always been kind of be slow and methodical. 
whether it's spring ball, you have 15 practices to get things in. Let it all stick. Be able to coach it all. And, and I go back and forth throughout my career. And you get here at North Dakota State, and we have everything in in five days. You know, essentially 90% of what we do. And, and we just – now it's all in, and our kids are getting a 1,000 reps. And the way we double rep, which I think is, is huge for their development. But I think, um, you know, so for us – you need to get what you say. You're, if you're going to hang your hat on something and you want your kids to believe in it, it's got to be early in install. And then throughout, as you keep adding, you got to come back to that with all the different variations, whether it's with motion, whether it's with unbalanced, whether it's formation of the boundary. And they got to see your base plays every day. Doesn't matter if it's not on the key for install, but they got to keep understanding and evolving with all the nuances to go with it. Okay. And so, you know, if you're going to be a power team, Get your one back power in on the first day with no pads on. But as you get your pad, you know, by day three, you better have 22 in and you better be lining up and smacking some dudes because I think if you can run the ball, your defense is going to be forced to learn how to stop the run right. and vice versa. You know, if they can stop the run, we got to get better at running the football against our own guys. And that, that's where the culture here has been so strong. And, you know, of course, on the outside, I'd heard of it and I knew Matt for a long time has been up here and, you know, Goose, our D-line coach, has been here for a long time. And I've known those guys. I knew that was the culture here. But when you get entrenched in it, I mean, our guys know, hey, if I can block our starting D-line for two days a week, All right. Saturdays, Saturdays, I got a chance versus anybody. Yep. You know. Um, and talk, Going on your install process, now how, do, how does it look for you? Does it go like board, film, walkthrough, or how do you – what's your thought on that? Great question. So I use the spring as my time to really get a feel with my players. And I believe guys evolve as they get older. So a, a, a freshman might think differently when he's a junior. Right. But that's, that's part of my spring initial evaluation is, hey, do you like the film stuff better? Do you like board talk? Uh, do you like pictures drawn? Or do you like walkthrough? And if you just ask your guys, they tell you. And if, it, usually it shows up as walkthroughs the most. Yeah, You know, as coaches, we love to sit there and point video out and tell them what we know and how to do it. But until they get to do it, it doesn't stick in their brain, doesn't file away. And so for me, um, you know, usually I, I try and get at least at least 10 minutes of walkthrough a day. If I have a 50-minute meeting, you know, we're getting out a little bit early to get to the field early so we can get the crucial points for the day walkthrough so they can see it. Um, you know, so that, that's, that's the biggest one for me. I want to introduce it. I teach it as a general scheme for probably five minutes. We watch tape of it so that they can see it being done. And then we go out and walk through the different looks. And here we get, we get to practice. So, um, and then when we build practice, we build it as part, 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 whole. You know, whether it's individual, then it's group, whether it's half line or inside run. or And then we get the full team at the end of the day. But when we practice that one period a day, whether it's inside or team, in spring ball and fall camp, I mean, we're going to double rip the heck out of it. And there might only be six linemen at one end, but it forces guys to learn other positions, to give each other a spill, some teamwork. And right. there's some serious brotherhood work that goes on if there's only six guys rotating for 35, 40 plays. Right. You know, <laughs> you look at each other. Yeah, definitely. Um, Next question is, so game, going to game planning, what's your game planning process look like? Um, maybe on a, you can go maybe through Monday through Friday or what have you, but up front, maybe you can talk about power and what you guys are looking for game planning wise. Um, what's the process look like for you up front and run game? Well, I think a lot of guys get caught up in, and it is important, is first level first. You know, uh, from a game plan standpoint, we have a unique offensive staff. I mean, every one of us has been an offensive coordinator. Hedberg's been a head coach. Uh, Dan Larson's been a head coach. So we got some great personalities, really smart guys that work well together. And so we got to look at what's best for everybody, not just our own position groups. Right. And I think everybody knows that. Right. So we always start with, hey, how are they going to support the run first? You know, what's their run support going to be? It has nothing to do with under or over or Oki. Or, you're going to get a seven-man box, four down and three backers or three down and four backers. Right. You don't have plays that can block those seven. It don't matter. Yep. So what's your run support? And then we're going to figure out where do we want to place the ball? And then depending on whether it's a read defense, whether it's a launch defense, a gap charge D, um, you know, we have different stuff that we've evolved. Our guys, we like for certain 
styles and technique versus certain fronts. You know, we build check packages in. Um, and then it, obviously it starts with what's run support. And it doesn't matter whether that's power. Um, you know, we'll run power versus every front out there. And we just, we, that's, a, that's a belief in our guy's head. We'll run inside zone versus every front out there. Now, obviously, some are better than others. Right. But if, if you know, if we're getting a bunch of uh, bare front, you know, people aren't going to live in inside zone. Essentially, there's five guys in the A and B gaps. Right. So it's, it's we're going to do different stuff to uh, really try and take advantage of what, what a defense is going to give us. That's is where we any, start. Sorry, I was, was going to say, is there any certain look that gets you guys out of power ever? <laughs> uh, no, we'll, no, we'll run it versus anything. No. There might be some tweaks in certain looks yeah. where uh, depending on how we're pulling or, or there might be a couple of like unique pictures that people, and more so the guys in our league, that know what we do and, and yeah. they – they see it every year, so they'll try some different stuff. And some teams have success. Well, then they all kind of lock that in in the summer. You know, it's, it's the study that's going on right now. Yeah. Uh, but as far as power zone slant, we'll run the counter. We'll run versus everything out there. Yeah. And like I said, it ain't always clean and perfect, but our guys have the answer to sprint to hit and, and do it fast. Good stuff. Um, that's the generic answer. I know you wanted a little more than yeah, that. Yeah, you're good. No, you're good. That's kind of how we hang our hat on that one. Yep. Um, maybe a little piggyback off that. When you're watching film, is there anything in particular you look for up front or um, maybe going to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I, I think one of the big ones is is I'm a big situational football guy. It's another thing I learned a lot from, from uh, you know, Chris out at Rutgers just from a defensive standpoint. There's The defense calls so much in situations. And, and sometimes, yeah, it's easy to see and break down. Sometimes it's not. Right. You, know, you got to get a feel for a guy and especially where he's at at that point in the season as a coordinator, what's his go-to, what's his hot buttons, what's going to get him to change. And, and if you can get a feel for that. So I watch as much game tape as I do cut-ups. I think it's easy to get lost into cut-ups and you forget, uh, Hey, there's still human beings playing this. There's an element to why these calls are coming out. And so for me, I try, we want to game plan our cut-ups during the week. And then as week goes, we do a lot more situational film. And so third down stuff, I love. I mean, I, I, if there's one thing I really like breaking down and studying, I love third down because I, I, I think it's where you really find the creative defensive coaches. It's where you find the sound defensive coaches. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of guys that just grab bag third down and we'll go out and run the ball because they're so ungapped sound. But, but guys that, you know, and I think that comes, it's, I was lucky. You get a coach in the Big Ten East for three years. You see Michigan. You see Ohio State. You see Michigan State. You know, Michigan State's schemes might be some of the best. Michigan uh, has a crazy, you know, Don Brown will do some crazy stuff. He's known for it. Right. But it's so sound. You know, every gap's covered. Everything's answered. And you see those guys. You really learn, um, you know, how, you got to be creative in the offensive attack too. And so if you can study a, a, a play caller, and then one thing we like to see is how certain guys play. Number one, motor. Can we can we get a guy to quit? Can we get a guy to tap out? And our guys know that early in the week. And then the next one is how is he going to see a read defense? Is he a gap charge? And that's that's a part I guys have to they have to really not only process and understand they got to know by Wednesday. Hey, this is how these guys are playing. And so you know our scout teams we put a lot of time in with them, and I think everybody says that. But it's not just a card that the youngest guy in the room draw. You know, our whole staff helps draw cards because for inside, I want every little thing done that I see on tape. And and I'll put a little note on there. Or I'll put a little sentence on there, you know, for seven on seven. Coach Pauly, Coach Hedberg, they want a perfect look out of this drop. Hey, I want the hook to curl more, more vertical this week. And we coach that up so it's not just, hey, I draw a hook to curl every week and it's the same. Right. It's going to look like our opponents. Okay. That's good. That's good stuff. Um, next question I got for you. Um, red zone. Is there anything particular you guys break down? How do you guys look at red zone? How do you guys prepare a game plan for that? Well, I think most teams, if you look at an offense and defense, both offense gets a little more conservative down there. You know, you don't have as much room to throw it. And right. You want to be extra bodies. You want, And we really stress, we want to stay opened up. We want to stay in rhythm, you know, as far down as we can go. And so, you know, we don't want to be hamstrung as well. They're just going to hand it off to stay in field goal range. Right. And I think that that comes with the success of the, the offense helps that. 
because you're not down there one time going, oh, man, this might be the only seven points, and then we got to hold on and play defense. You know, maybe one week a year you're going to see a defense like that. But I, I remember there was times at places I've been where you're going, we don't score a whole lot. Every play counts. I mean, every play counts. Don't get me wrong. But we're going to get down there. We're going to have some fun and keep people honest. You know, we're going to run screens and reverses on first down. We're going to run that stuff in the red zone. We're going to – it's not just third down calls. And I think that is where Tyler does an awesome job of dialing stuff up. So he's really hard to predict. Um, you know, and he's hes a guy, if you meet him, he is 1,000 degrees at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. But, man, when he calls that play, he's 88 and just chilling. He does not get high and low. You're breaking up, Coach. I don't know if you're talking now. You're breaking up a little bit. I got you now. We're good. Um, game day wise, so are you are you in the box on game day? Or are you on the field? I'm on the field. Okay. And you know, I was I was up for two years when I called plays, and I think as a play caller, it helps up there. Unless yeah. maybe you were a quarterback, or you know, sometimes head guys are calling it. I think it helps just because it does help keep that even keel. Yeah. You don't get caught up in the emotions quite as much. Um, but I'm also a believer. I don't know if an old line coach is a great coordinator. And that that's from my own experience. But you have five guys that you got to be able to answer questions. If you have a 10-play drive or an 8-play drive, they're all going to have questions. Right. And, and you, Good point. I found, I found I'm just a much better old line coach. And I think that's, you know, you look around, old line coaches are becoming, you're seeing more and more head coaches. But coordinators, it's still far and few because the good old line guys, they need to be hunkered in with their guys. You have half the offense every snap you're responsible for. That's a good point. What where do you burn your eyes on game days? Like I obviously you're not ball watching. What are you what are you looking for defensively? Uh maybe in the box on game day. You know, I think I think my biggest thing is 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 the way we'll break stuff up is is we all have different things we'll watch throughout the game. Right. Um, you know, Ty's calling it, obviously taking all the feedback and information. But uh, you know, for me, I'm always I'm usually trying to watch how they're playing certain surfaces, two man, three man surface. I'm I'm watching defense the whole time. Right. You know, I, I, so I have to trust my guys, and I told them that. I said, guys, I'm not going to lose my mind on you, um, but I see where the defense is at. So if something happens and there's some TFL or said, I know who it was and I know where he was lined up, so I am going to come to you and ask what happened, what did you see, how did it go down. But I need good feedback. Right. And, and I think if you have mature guys, my guys got no problem. Hey, coach, I missed that backside cutoff. That's all me. Don't worry. It'll be good. Don't worry about it. It's nothing to worry about. Okay. Guys getting after me. I'm struggling with him. Okay. Now it's on me. How do I get this kid help? So did that come back in? I saw it broke up a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. You're back. Yeah. We didn't miss much. Like you could hear the audio. Okay. Um, now getting to cut some, some scheme stuff um, going on with power. Some of the guys asked me, what are your, some of your everyday drills you do with power with, with your guards and tackles? Uh, maybe well, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. We, you know, we'll work. So we go – Sunday is really our off day. <clears throat> we come back Monday. We watch the tape with the guys short and sweet. I mean, real short. Getting on to the next opponent. And we'll even have a, a, a mini practice kind of as, as a Monday jog through. and uh, So we'll go out, introduce the defense, and we will – you know, we'll do a lot of our pull work on a Monday because it's not as violent. It's more footwork oriented. It's more spatial. I do a lot of D line bag drills because as a puller, you got to be able to put your foot in the ground and redirect. Right. You got to be able to, you know, and so I'll, they'll be high stepping over bags and they'll get a whistle. I have to redirect and then a whistle and have to go fit the backer. And so we do a lot of different timing stuff with that. Um, and then we do, uh, we do a pretty cool circuit when we have a bye week or spring ball or fall camp. Coach ends is an old D line coach. Okay, our head coach, and he lo I I I loved watching Kirk Ferentz come down and coach for Indy as a head coach. Mm -hmm. I loved it as a player. I loved it as a GA. And so even though Matt was a D line coach and defensive guy by nature, he played O line in high school. And so I include him, and I we get him down there, man. We have a blast, and he's hooping and hollering, and and you know got a little spit flying again, and he gets his juices back coming down helping coach the O line. And, and I love our guys feeling that for me. You know, as a defensive guy here, traditionally, he, he's done an awesome job injecting himself into the offense, the offensive staff. Uh, but from a drill standpoint, 
we'll work doubles. You know, I'll work lateral doubles, vertical doubles. Um, we'll work down blocks, you know, for some of our pin pull stuff or our centers and guards that are blocking back. Um, you know, and, and one of the big ones is, you know, we'll work all three poles. We have three poles here. We have a square pole, which everybody loves to ask about. Right. I was going to ask you, but we're good. Oh, yeah. we, we can talk about that later. And we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll pull her up and look at her. And then we've got a skip pole, which we'll use for our outside power a little bit. And then we have a straight pull, which is kind of a trap pull. It's counter. It's, it's where we're trying to kick the edge out. Right. So to do that, you got to work them. If you're going to be good at all three, you got to work them. And I was going to ask you about skip pull. And the guys were asking me how you teach it. Um, I don't know if you want to pull up film now. We can do it later yeah. or whenever. Yeah, but maybe yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the best drawer here, but just a second. Let's see if I can do this with you. This helps a little bit. Um, you got a whiteboard there. Can you see it? Yep, we can. Okay. You know, obviously, I'm going to go a little green and go. This is not drawing because drawing with my mouse is not very good. Okay. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I'm a shitty drawer as well, so you're good. Don't don't evaluate my circles. <laughs> but if we're going to run power to the right, okay, for our square pole, we are going to be straight back, straight back, shuffle, shuffle, and that allows us to insert right in the A-gap. And our biggest one is you've got to go, you cannot, and the difference in a square and a skip, a square pull, we go straight back with both feet. It kind of allows better timing for our lateral combos. But our, our square pull, we keep everything square as can be to the line of scrimmage, okay? In the skip pull, the difference in our footwork is, you know, we will, our bat, let me get this draw tool here. Uh, in our skip pull, We'll still step with the opposite foot, but we're bringing this foot right about here. Then your second foot is coming to balance up. And now you're able to hit a little bit wider path. Does that make sense? Yes. So so our, our skip pull is almost a karaoke out of there. I think everybody, a lot of people are working that right now. Right. Is we are literally trying to be straight off the ball. Okay. In essence. Shot, and now we're under control to insert in that A gap. You take 300 pounders and you get them karaoke in, or you get them hurrying. And, right. and the one thing I love about this, it's the one pull where I can tell a guy, slow down, slow down, you know, because they, they step off the ball and it's off, off. And then we go shuffle, shuffle. They put that at, at play side foot in the ground. They should be able to go straight ahead. And it helps clear up the kick out. It helps with their ID backer. It helps. Keep everything walled outside to the call. And okay. I think that's the one thing we're trying to do is mesh that together with everything else. And then you talked about, like, the, the counter pull to kick. Um, how do you guys teach that? I know that's pretty universal, but. Um, oh, that's good. good. It's a good question. And, and so it's the same exact. I'm going to pull this up, the same picture now. And, uh, all right, here we go. You know, our, the difference here is we will, if we're running counter to the right, what we'll do is we'll, we'll that first step, that play side foot now, We'll come open, and we'll tuck that right elbow in our hip so that we are – our shoulders now are perpendicular to the line of scrimmage, or I should almost – let me redraw this. Good coach. I always say a good coach is detailed in his drawings. <laughs> our, our shoulders are square to the angle we're going to go kick out. Does that make sense? Yes. And we're kicking out into the line of scrimmage. So all we're doing, that play side foot is dropping, tuck the elbow in my hip, and it's a, once again, big guys can run straight ahead pretty dang good. Right. But when you ask them to run roundabouts, and you know that's why I think the squ the skip pole evolved was so their shoulders could stay as square as possible. But but in the in in, in the old days, and this is how I pulled in high school, it was the only one pole we had. Everything was you know legitimately open up, and then you'd run over here, and you'd round it. Right. You know, trying to block this guy. Your coach kept chewing your butt somebody always undercut you. Right. And so that's where the skip pull evolved. And now for us, you know, when we want to run tighter, our square pull has got to even be slower so that our guys, when they, when they, uh, when they shuffle over, let's see here, when they shuffle over, their shoulders are square right now that they go straight ahead. And I think that's how all three of them kind of, kind of work well together. So. And then um, I had a couple questions, maybe, on um, running back aiming point with 
power out of the gun. Now, how do you, I, I know you, I, you guys run it a little bit, but I've had a, a lot of questions on you guys' running back aiming point um, and footwork sure. in the gun on power. Sure. I, I, won't, I won't fake to be the guru. Uh, Tyler played in the offense. Uh, Dan Larson, our running backs coach. There's not a lot of places I got a running backs coach as a head coach. And an ex-OC, I mean, he was the OC at Minnesota Duluth, who was really successful. So, uh, you know, we're lucky there to have a guy who he treats a one-back position with the back and no different than our quarterbacks get coached in the amount of detail right. and the expectations. So, um, you know, Dan, Dan would be the guru as far as all of our footwork. And okay. I know the big one for us and the, the big one in my experience has always made sure that that tailback's not out running the point guard. And or whoever the second puller is, if it's counter, it's whoever your your tight end, your tackle, whoever. But he's fitting the inside hip. And and, and our aiming point, we like to keep him tight on everything. Whether it's our A gap or it's our C gap power, they're still fitting the hip because that guard's pull should bring them to their hole, if that makes sense. Right. That makes sense. So that, that's one of the big ones I talk with guys about. And then on, you guys run a ton of power read. You guys run it really well, especially this past year. Um, how do you guys handle a, a, a DN that charges mesh on power read? Do you guys um, do you guys handle that any certain way? How do we handle a what? You broke up there for a second. Uh, DN or five tech that, that charges the mesh. Do you guys have any answers for that or? Yeah, yeah. What we'll do? I mean, we do we do some different stuff. Obviously, you know, with a quarterback who makes good decisions. Right. You know, a lot of times he'll make us right on that. You know, mesh charge is tough. We got guys that sprint straight up field just to, because they want to keep it boxed. Right. You know, no matter what the defense is going to do, they're trying to try and force your hand. Um, and, and so you got to work what you see on tape, and then you got to run it enough. You know, we'll work a, a mesh circuit, and our guys are our jet circuit, at least at least once a week in the season and probably at least every other day during any camp, fall camp, spring ball, um, so that they get a chance to read that as much as they can, you know, and if, if you get any kind of mesh charges, we'll widen splits. We, we got all kinds of little wrinkles that, that help with that. Yeah. Um, but if they're going to mesh charge a lot, they're guys that should be pretty easy to reach at times too, you know, so we're going to block them and reach them and, and really make them stay honest because their job as a mesh charger is also to be the edge of the defense. Right. They're the contained player. So if you want to squeeze it tight, there's always an answer no different than offense. You know, if we're, we're going to try and run outside zone, yeah, we get a little softer sometimes in, in the reach block. And so those are things you got to know the strengths and weaknesses of every technique you're going to teach. Now, when it comes to tight ends, when you guys run a power, um, do you guys have certain rules for him on power when he's on the ball, or does, does it change up front for you guys when tight ends on the ball and power? You know, on the ball, off the ball, it doesn't matter for us so much. The one thing, and I think it's the, the, the history, of the, the once again, the culture here, Right. You know, we'll we'll run counter from on the ball. We'll run. We run. We run all the unorthodox ways to do things, because we. I mean, we reverse out and slant. You know, so you, with the quarterback. So you right. start doing all these things that, that are not supposed to be able to be done, and we'll try them. And our defense is like that stuff's hard, man. That stuff's. And, and if it gives our guys fits, we know it'll give everybody else fits because Cole Greens is as sound as they are, and you know they they keep things pretty simple on their end. But if we can give them fits, that's the stuff we'll, we'll tend to do a decent amount of. And, uh, but as far as rules for our guys, we have arc rules, just like everybody else's power arc. We have, you know, inline rules. If it's everybody, your power down rules. Um, you know, because it's our base play, we have a bunch of different wrinkles to complement, whether it's one tight end, two tight ends, three tight ends, you know, two fullbacks. It's It's been the evolution of just it started out with A-gap power and, it's really turned into to so much more, you know, since then. Right. So Pat Perlis, when he brought it in with Coach Bowl, and it was kind of the, the core of everything. And, you know, Pat's a good buddy of, of Phil Parker, who I GA'd for at Iowa, who I think is one of the best, if not the best defensive coordinator in the country, uh, in how sound he teaches and the, the, the production he gets out of guys in the back end and really the whole defense. You know, Iowa, their offense and their whole line has been dominant for years, but but their defense – but their, their defense is, is why they're as good as they are year in, year out. And right. Whether it was Phil or Norm, you know, Pat and, and Phil were college teammates, and it goes back to the fundamentals of football. Right. But that's what Pat brought in and said, we're going to get good at this, and then it's continued to add an evolution every year, just a different piece. So. You, you talked about um, two tight end sets. I noticed when I watched some of your guys' games that 
on first down, you, you guys like to get double tight, like right away. Do you guys have a, a reasoning for that? I noticed you guys do it a lot on first down. I don't know if it's well, like a it, tempo thing or. You know, that's something I need to go back and check now because because we do a, try and do a pretty good job. We probably have wing surfaces more than we have double tight. Um, you know, it's, when you get into our 22 stuff, it gets a little creative because that box gets packed anyways. Right. But, uh, but, but we'll use both of those surfaces just to, depending on uh, is a team going to try and wing bust us? You know, then what do we got to do to get outside of that? If a team's going to play loose, what do we do to take advantage of the inside? And, um, you know, so we'll, we'll film study surfaces a lot. We really research, um, you know, Ben Klinger was our QC before. Connor Sanger is, is brand new. But the, the, we'll do a lot of surface study, two-man surface, three-man surface, four-man surface. How does a defense want to line to that? Um, at what point do they want to knock the front and kick the whole front over and treat a different guy like the center? And so those are things we really like to, you know, we'll look at a lot of tape because that stuff doesn't show up on a lot of offenses. Right. And so, you know, you start getting into 22, it's still not, you can go find 8,000 snaps of 11 personnel every week and maybe 9,000 of 10 personnel, depending right. on what you're doing. So for us, we might have six snaps of 22 over a six week study. Well, then we got to go back and watch the other six weeks of the season. So our, our guys do a ton of digging, you know, our, our, some of our top 22 and 20, you know, 13. And, you know, if we got enough tight ends and depending on pullbacks and where we're at with receive, you know, our receivers, what, what we've done with the receivers this past year, I mean, they're, they're sharp now. They come in, they're fold blocking. And, and if they continue to grow at that pace, we'll, we'll match personnel up. So we put guys on the field because the defense is going to match our personnel before they get anything else. Right. So that that's the thing right now is is with us is but I don't think, you know, consciously we don't think about double tight or, gotcha. or wing surface. We think week to week what's going to help us the best. Okay. Um I had a question in my head as you were talking. Um power, what what gives you guys the biggest fits or maybe maybe your opinion here. What what do you think uh, gives the power the most fits? defensively maybe structural uh, look or you know I everybody you know my biggest one is we saw it all last year we saw over fronts we saw loaded fronts three five nine we saw Sam strong safety pressures we saw uh, Sam Mike pressures we saw three four pressures and really it, if we can't operate really fast we'll get to the next scheme that we can and we'll know kind of a coordinator's blitz structure yeah you know if we get into week Past week three, if we see a new – I'd say past week five, if we see a new blitz, your guys aren't ready to fit everything we can run. You know, so if you might be ramping it up just to stop power some weeks, which right, we get point. a um, You know, I, you got to kind of go look at – just like us, we don't put a new play in for one week. If we don't see carryover for it throughout the year, we're not going to put a wrinkle in just to, just to go for one guy and yeah. then never use it. Really expensive for the two or three times we use it. And if we got somebody that's going to put a whole new blitz in that we didn't see, we don't have a plan for, we don't have a, a, a you know, our, our guys wired for, you know, our big thing is if we see something brand new, our guys chuckle on the sideline and go, Hey, don't worry about it, coach. You know, cause we've wired it. If they're th grab bag and throwing new stuff at us, right. they don't have any for all of it. There's no way they could have practiced it. Right. That's a good point. I'm sure you can hear my, my dog in the background, but uh, hey, you're good. You're good. Uh, Last question for you. Um, power counter, what's your favorite scheme and, and why? Oh, man, I've run counter for years because it is a good complement to, to a lot of the zone stuff. You know, you get 11 personnel, everybody thinks it's easier. But, you know, I've, we explored a little bit with some 11 personnel, just a gap, you know, our, some of our power last year and worked really good for us. It, our biggest one is in the past, I think you've seen defenses really load the box, play a lot more man, a lot more press coverage. Well, instead of one or two, one really good receiver and a bunch of good receiver, we have we have three to five guys now that can go out there and they can win one on one matchups. Right. So so eleven personnel, you know, we ran counter really good a couple couple times last year because it was a heavy dose. We thought we could. People were loading our tight end surface up, and then we ran power pretty good. You know, when people wanted to try and play us balanced, and so it, it really is take what they're going to give you. And, and I know we're gonna we're gonna find a way to run a gap power every week. But we're also we're also going to be smart as coaches, and make sure and go. Hey, if they got twenty seven guys in between the a gaps, let's try and get off tackle a little bit. Yeah, that's good. 
Well, Coach, I really appreciate you coming on and, and, and giving us some insight on what you guys do over at North Dakota State. I know a lot of the guys that I talked to are really excited, so I really appreciate you hopping on and, and helping us out. Heck, yeah. I, I love it. You keep keep keep. Uh, you do a good job finding some of that video, so keep putting it out there because if our guys are getting physical, they enjoy watching it. Yeah, there we go. I definitely will. <laughs> Again, man, I really appreciate it. Good luck this year. And if we have – which it's going to happen. I'm convinced we're going to play football this year, but – um definitely good luck might this be year. modified yeah, yeah it might be modified but we're gonna play right we're gonna play some football but i'll, I'll keep in touch man good luck and uh and uh we'll talk have a good one man hey, thanks a million you too all right see you bye see you bye-bye